Hello, good morning everyone. I hope you are all awake. If not, it's not too late. Please grab a cup of coffee and get ready to rock and roll. So we have just one short hour together, but we're gonna try to make the most of it. Uh, today, it's going to be about customer success and support, about growth path, and about sharing tips with you guys, with our three amazing speakers, to hopefully give you some ideas, perhaps even inspire you on how you can take your career in customer success and support to the next stage. I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Tiff and I am a client partner, but also I was the country opener for Toucan, a data visualization company previously based in France and now in the US. But without further ado, I will introduce you to our three amazing speakers today. Um, by the way, again, uh, to mirror what parties just say earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them using the Slido. We'll keep 10 to 15 minutes in the end to answer them, so please feel free. So, uh, to start with, I'm going to introduce you to Damon. Damon, if you want to wave uh, a little bit. So here you have Damon. Damon has been in technical customer support roles for the last eight years of their career. Now as a technical solutions engineer uh, at Mabel, a test automation startup, they are using their experience to help shape the Mabel customer support experience. Welcome Damon and thanks for being here with us today. Moving on to our second speaker, Sid, if you want to also like uh, do a quick wave. Sid, thanks for being here. Uh, you have been a cloud solution architect at uh, SaaS and product centric startup for over eight years now, focusing on a broad spectrum of um, different jobs from pre-sales to product to partner development and even obviously post-sales customer success operation. She has also worked on a lot of development and implementation projects, which I'm sure are going to be very insightful as you will be sharing tips and insights with us today. And finally, last but not least, please uh, welcome uh, Jerry. Jerry, if you want to say also like hi, uh, a, a, a quick wave. Um, Jerry is a queer Latina from Puerto Rico who comes with 15 years of experience coaching success teams and advising businesses on digital marketing, growth strategy, and analytics. And she currently works at Clavio as a senior customer success manager, where she supports enterprise clients all around the world. So again, welcome to the three of you. And I guess this is time for us to rock and roll. All right. I'm going to start off with a first question, general question. Can you, uh, all of you, or you know, just uh, uh, a few of you, define what means for you customer success and support at your current role or uh, your current company? Perhaps, uh, Damon, if you want to start on that one. Yeah, happily, um, more than all. So uh, at Mabel right now, customer success and customer support really like we, we have a test automation platform. So making sure that customers can really uh, make sure that their product, that their product is tested well, supported well, um, handling questions, basically as soon as someone has them, our goal is to get back to them really quickly with answers um, and making sure that as, as their, their testing coverage needs to increase, that they find all the support and strategy and kind of topics and information that they might need to find success. Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, you know, like that's, uh, that, that totally is like a, a great example uh, of how you can perceive customer success. Uh, does any one of you, maybe Sid, uh, like, do you have anything else to add from your perspective? I know, uh, I know you've had like a lot of experience with startups, so perhaps you can bring also a different perspective on, uh, uh, on that one. Yeah, absolutely. I think the customer success aspect begins with uh, some of those initial calls that, uh, you know, at startups in SaaS world, you have this a sales cycle of a BDR, business development rep, uh, making these cold calls or reaching out and having those uh, follow-ups and leads. Uh, from those interactions as to how you represent the company and the uh, product, and going from that journey all the way to, uh, you know, going through a proof of concept, making that sale happen, 
these are all aspects of customer success as well, because each of those interactions are setting up the expectations that they can expect from the product and the company, uh, keeping those realistic so there are no certain surprises post sales, uh, uh, because you want to make the customer successful using the product and then have them be a customer over the years uh, and also spread good word of mouth marketing. Sounds good. And what's, what's very interesting here is that uh, I can hear and we can all hear that you really have this uh, broad spectrum uh, over uh, those different uh, roles within a, a, a company. And uh, perhaps also there's something quite interesting here because obviously when you're in a startup, uh, your role as a customer success might be more uh, broad, like you might touch upon different uh, uh, Areas. Um, yet, uh, Jerry, I know that uh, you've worked previously at, you know, like a, a, a bigger company, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So, can you perhaps like tell us a little bit what's your perspective on how um, customer success uh, is perceived or uh, is, you know, like uh, uh, worked uh, as a job maybe in a big company compared to uh, smaller, you know, like start startups? Like, do you see any difference in this role? Oh yeah, huge differences. In a uh, larger company, you'll normally uh, play a smaller role. You usually have very specific role um, and you kind of stay in your lane. There are processes already developed for you and there's usually a lot more red tape in my experience. <laughs> um, whereas in a startup, especially early stage startups, you don't really see a lot of processes um, in place. Um, you kind of are building, building the, the train tracks as you go. Um, and you have a lot more opportunity in an early stage startup to really define your role, kind of work across, not necessarily specialize as much, but just get different experiences, uh, you know, across the company. So there's, there's more of an opportunity to um, shape what the role will look like in an early stage company. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, like to, to, to your point, perhaps like uh, uh, also in terms of those differences, uh, that's, that's true that uh, uh, there's, you know, uh, a difference between when you work on it from a big corporation perspective to a startup. And uh, Damon, actually, I think uh, 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 we would love to have your perspective. You also spend a lot of time in startup, but you also spend some time at Apple. So like probably uh, you also have a perspective to complete on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and um, to, to what uh, Yadi was just saying, like as in that bigger company, you definitely have like, I need to do this task. This is the task in front of me. I have to get this done. That's my job. That's my role. That's what I do. Um, and, but from like the, the sheer difference from that to that startup world is definitely how many hats you wear and how much of an impact like you can actually have not just on the customers, but also kind of looking back into the team and into the company and into the product, how much your actions can reflect back into that. So doing things like as, as the, so in my, I'm kind of like the tier two, the only tier two support at my company. So I have a very interesting perspective because I have more of the technical understanding, but I also have to understand the product at, and interact with the customers at that level, at that like, like what level they're at, which means that I get a very interesting perspective where I'm not just answering their questions, but I'm also looking for trends and communicating that back to the product team and working closely with many different parts of the company to refine the experience, not just for that one person that's reaching out with a question on how to do something, but for every person that interacts with the, comp with the app itself. So you're not really just doing this one thing. It's, oh, I have this information now. What teams in my company can be positively impacted by it? And I think that that's a really interesting, different perspective that I've really enjoyed having in the startup world as opposed to that kind of bigger corporate cons um, company. No, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think uh, myself also being uh, uh, in a startup, for sure, like you feel that you are even more empowered and you, you can bring up your personal touch. And I think one topic, um, you know, that's uh, that is very dear uh, to uh, you know like a lot of us and and probably also all our attendees today is diversity. I think uh, obviously personality is 
a thing, but I want to touch upon diversity a little bit here because uh, this is such an important topic and um, perhaps, uh, you know, like having uh, uh, Jerry having uh, one of your insight, uh, being uh, obviously like uh, from a cross-cultural ba background, but also a woman in tech, diversity can be defined very differently, the gender, ethnicity, like to your uh, perspective, like how can diversity play a role in customer success today? Uh, one of the main ways that I think diversity can really impact the role is just the empathy um, that you have from having different experiences that may not be typical to the general norm. Um, anybody who has an atypical experience in whatever way, whether you're neuroatypical, you know, you're an underrepresented gender race, um, you're very skilled in quickly scanning the room, identifying what are those norms that are the typical norm and adapting in a way that isn't necessarily something that people who are part of the, the standard norm have to do. Um, anybody who's traveled to a different country knows exactly what I'm saying. You're thrown into a completely different environment and you have to like figure out what's what. You're gonna make mistakes, but then that helps you connect with people in a way that um, is really beautiful. I think it brings a lot to the role. Um, other ways that I think diversity plays a role is really diversity of experience. Um, even thinking about myself, I was a community organizer in my past. Um, so uh, that experience of being able to uh, work with different organizers, figure out quickly, okay, who are you? What do you like to do? What role do I put you in? That helps me really connect with my customers. I can quickly identify, oh, this customer is somebody that needs a lot of documentation. They need something instruction step by step. I can't give them something broad and expect that they'll run, take it and run with it. Whereas other customers might um, need, you know, just cut, you know, cut all of that, go straight to the to the bone and marrow, show me how to do it. Um, so I think, you know, that's those are just a couple of examples. Uh, going back to the neuroatypical folks, folks with ADHD, for example, are known to be very creative. So they can come up with solutions that somebody that um, is not, doesn't have that, um, you know, th there's just so much richness that it can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. I would add to that, like, you know, same idea uh, also goes in terms of product development and all customer reach. Um, like at Cloud Health, we were trying to expand out into different markets, uh, Europe, uh, for example, or uh, South America. And it was very helpful, especially as a startup, to have people from different cultures and different backgrounds, to be able to understand the cultural norms, to be able to understand how to sort of work with certain things that uh, they bring from their uh, sort of societal upbringing, right? Like uh, certain norms that only they're familiar with and you're trying to make headways into be able to sell into that market and have success uh, and retain customers there. How do you go about that process uh, if you are unable to understand why do you the falling uh, through the cracks? You know, like if you were able to have successful business uh, only then does customer success come into play and having diversity allows for you to have those sales uh, smoothly and understand the market. Actually, Sid, to your point, even talking about how you can, different perspectives can shape the products that are built. Uh, there's a wonderful book, I'm forgetting it right now, but um, where the author discussed building a, a airplane chair. The airplane chair as we know it today, or the car chair as we know it today, was originally built for a specific, you know, six foot one guy, I don't know. Um, and then they realized that there were a broad range of bodies that just weren't comfortable in that chair. So even just testing a product with different um, kinds of people, speaking to different kinds of companies from a product perspective can help uh, make the product that you're building more applicable to a broader range of people. Yep, uh, absolutely. I think uh, you guys, you know, like touched upon very important topics. At the end of the day, to be successful, a company needs to be diverse because that brings more innovations, that brings more ideas to the table. And that's how uh, we can, uh, you know, like iterate on uh, new ideas, create a product that are going to engage even more audiences and at the end of the day, sales more. So thank you so much. I think diversity is such an important topic nowadays. And 
was also interesting, uh, a second, uh, I think, area that I wanted to touch upon, uh, and that's already coming from your perspective about how different a startup um, customer success role can be from a corporation uh, start, uh, corporation success role is um, the I would say like the the visibility you have over the whole process. I think customer success that's uh, what I loved about uh, what you said said uh, just right before uh, when we discussed before this uh, panel is that customer success starts from the very first interaction. Uh, and I really wanted uh, you guys actually to touch upon that and perhaps uh, Sid, you can start with that, but can you talk a little bit about how pre-sales uh, can influence post-sales customer success? Mm. Absolutely, Tiff. Uh, so uh, the idea of the first interaction is to go about, uh, you know, whether you are able to have successful meeting to be able to get that meeting uh, from the customer to be able to do a proof of value or just a demo, right? Uh, and how do you go about that process? It, you have to understand your market fit, uh, the product fit, and see if the customer has a problem that you can solve. And everything starts from that, right? So going from that model into from pre-sales to post-sales, uh, the connection is that during the proof of concept, you're trying to show product features that will actually solve the use cases. And then also there are aspects usually in startups, right? So because the startup idea is the product is still taking shape, it's developing and it'll take different directions based on the market. So if you're glued into uh, the market and understanding what your prospects needs are, then you're having these conversations about potential roadmap features as well, right? Uh, what level do you promise that? Are you over promising and then under delivering after the fact leading to uh, sort of a dissatisfaction with the product and the company? Or are you laying it down in a way where the sale is possible as well because you're aware about your engineering team and product team's capability of churning out or you know, bringing out features? Uh, so you represent your company and your product in pre-sales uh, accurately. And then you provide those insights uh, that you've had from the uh, interactions with uh, prospects about what their needs and uh, wants are from the product, which areas they need to focus on, uh, what are the stakeholders? What are this contact information? You hand that information off to, you know, if you are big enough to have a customer success team, hand it off to them, or you retain those details for yourself or in Salesforce, whatever tool you're using to be able to have those interactions on an ongoing basis a year later as well. So, uh, so yeah, so the connection of getting all those details, handing it over to post sales, if there is a post sales team or keeping them somewhere so that anyone who takes on that relationship is able to execute properly. No, definitely. I think, uh, I think this is just right. Uh, it's very important uh, to set uh, the tone, the right tone, right from the first, uh, right from the first interaction. So I think uh, uh, this is uh, very important, even when you work in post sales to understand the whole cycle, to be able to better do your job for sure. Um, perhaps, uh, uh, Damon, I know that uh, you've also worked uh, at numerous startups. So um, if you, uh, do, do you have any more insights on that one perhaps? Yeah, um, one kind of slightly interesting perspective that I've got with where I'm at right now, um, we kind of consider the customer support as part of the product. So something that we've done that's a little bit different than what I've experienced in the past is we make sure that from the POC level that every single, every single prospect is aware of our support and tries to utilize it. So not only are like, do we have someone like a technical or like a, a solutions architect or like a, a pre-sale or a sales engineer working with them to try and like build solutions and understand the product really well. We also are trying to build that relationship with our support team right from the get-go. Um, as soon as someone comes in, we introduce that even as like part of our demonstration to make sure that they're aware of it and kind of interact with it at that level. So we're not just build, we're building trust and we're building a relationship with our support team before they even get to the point where they're a paying customer. And that does a couple of things. It makes it one, that handoff that Sid was just referencing, that makes that so much smoother because we already have some formation of a relationship there that we can lean on and work with. We have an understanding of some of their like interactions and their applications and what they're working with. Um, and it just makes the, the handoff be a little bit smoother. 
from the but um kind of switching it and just kind of backing up what Sid said I did I was a, a solutions architect before my current role um and so I was actually in that kind of pre-sales role as well and there is a lot of trust that it that you have to build during that time and to Sid's point like don't over promise and under deliver. That is the worst thing that you can possibly do because you're setting wrong expectations. You're ruining trust. You're like, you said you'd build this, you didn't. And when you have the ability to kind of just meet them where you're currently at and help them get the, what real value they can actually get out of the product and get an understanding of it, of what that tool can do for them, actually do for them. Um, there's a lot of trust that then builds out the entire, the, that shapes the entire rest of the way that relationship works. Um, so once that handoff actually happens, it's a much easier, smoother interaction because that trust is already there that you can lean on to make it so everything else works well. Yep, absolutely. And uh, actually uh, to touch upon something that you just said, that, that's, uh, that's gonna be a great transition for my next question. Uh, you said, uh, and also uh, I think uh, most of you uh, uh, on our panel today, you all have had experiences where you have to transition from one role to another one. So if we obviously talk about uh, our topic today, customer success and uh, people that are at, uh, attending this conversation, um, could you please uh, touch upon like how you can use skills that you learn on different roles, uh, you know, pre-sales roles, uh, uh, other types of role uh, within a company to transition effectively and successfully to customer success. Like how would you, you know, like use those skills to transfer them to a more customer success and support role? Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Jerry, may maybe you want to touch upon that to start? Yeah, I, I joke around that I've been in customer success since I was younger because I would help my aunt translate in doctor's offices when, you know, with Spanish. Um, but I, I, as I mentioned, I started my career at Blue Cross and Blue Shield in a call center working with um, some very heartbreaking stories in some cases. You're dealing with, you know, health, um, you know, so just thinking back of situations where, you know, you're dealing with sickness and how do you help somebody um, process a claim um, and understand how they're being billed when they're already going through an emotionally trying time. Um, I also was an organizer. So being able to really understand, okay, what's the bigger picture of, the, of what you're trying to produce? If you're producing an event, for example. Um, and there was a period of time between you know, finishing Blue Cross, being an organizer, and I wasn't sure what I was gonna do. Um, so I became a consultant for a few years, ran a brand and communications industry. So that's where I deepened my marketing expertise. All of that really helped me transition into the role I have today at Blue Cross and Blue, uh, sorry, at Clavio. <laughs> um, so this, Clavio is actually the first tech company that I've worked with. Um, and what helped me transition there is I wasn't sure where I wanted to go. And it was actually when I uh, joined Startup Institute, it was an organization that was meant to help people understand careers in, in tech, where I met a mentor, um, Alan Tellio, hi. <laughs> and he really, just speaking to him about my experience, I already had all of the skills that I needed, but customer success is a very tech-specific term. Um, there are a number of different um, careers you can come from that actually really translate well to tech, and just putting my experience in, from, in front of somebody that already had that lens helped me see what was possible. Um, some of, the, some of the best CS uh, folks that I know came from the restaurant industry, talk about high pressure, you know, and really being able to build relationships. So I, you know, I, I would say that that helped just speaking to other people. I highly encourage anybody that's considering CS, talk to people in the industry, um, talk to people in the industry, talk about your experience, and they'll be able to help you see and reframe and repackage what you already bring to the table. Yeah, thank you. I think this is so uh, important uh, to uh, be able to talk to uh, uh, other people, to confront your ideas uh, so that you can also, uh, you know, uh, uh, rework on 
the pitch on yourself to that uh, new uh, customer success role that uh, you might want. And yeah, I think you mentioned mentorship, but I'm just going to touch upon that like right after that. I just wanted to also have uh, Damon's perspective here. Like for you, Damon, like uh, what are the qualities that you should have to really be a good customer success and support specialist today? Yeah, happily. Um, real quick, I just want to mention that I worked in restaurants and never really until just now associated like the skills that I picked up from that with what I do now. And I, and like, that is such a, it's so true there you pull out, there's so much that you can pull from that. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I hadn't really ever made that connection. Um, going back to the, the question at hand. So when, with the customer success and customer support, like there's, it's a very interesting role because I think it both takes like IQ as well as EQ, which means that there's a lot of different perspectives that you can come from that all kind of tie into your ability to do this role well. Um, the, the EQ aspect of like that emotional part where you've got people that aren't feeling well and you've got like that empathy that you're building with them or the restaurant business where you're making quick connections and, and trying to like figure out what's going on. Oh, it's your birthday. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations, happy birthday. Like, there's there, but also to the technical side, where like um, one other aspect of some of the roles I've done in the past were QA based, quality assurance based, where it's very like, how does this work? Why did it break? How can I reproduce it? What are the specific technical breakdowns that got us to this issue and this problem? And both sides of that are astronomically beneficial when it comes to a support role, because you're not just dealing with the person that's on the other side of either the call, the, the table when I was at Apple, like whoever it, you're working with, They've got two different problems. They've got the emotional side, or they've got the actual technical problem that they came in with. This thing isn't working, but they've also got their emotional side, which is that trust that I was going to before. Like I expected this to be working and now it's not. And you're not just working with them to get that technical issue there. You're also working with them to rebuild that trust. You're working with them to make sure that they feel comfortable with the product and continuing to use it. So there's a lot like of different perspectives and interactions and things that you've done in your life, almost all of which in one way, shape or form have the ability to come back and benefit you in your support role. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. I so completely agree with that idea as well. Having the empathy uh, and communication uh, styles to be able to interact with different stakeholders at different levels, uh, like Damon and Jeremy just said that, you know, depending on where you are at the interaction level uh, with uh, at the Apple store or at a pizza store, right? Like uh, you have customers. The idea remains the same. It's a product or a service you're delivering and there's somebody at the other end expecting that to be delivered in a certain way uh, based on the price that they're paying, right? And, and, the, and the SLA that you set forth, right? Uh, the service level agreement of, we will do X, Y, Z. We'll get back to you in 24 hours for priority one. You have different support tiers. Do you have different customer success packages? Like Jeremy was saying that uh, it was like a, a startup uh, world, a tech world where you talk about customer success more so uh, than traditional enterprises. Uh, but the idea remains the same. The communication skills that you can develop from different jobs, different roles. Like I have been on the QA side of things as well. Uh, the development and implementation projects were going through that actual uh, cycles of software development life cycle where you do the entire requirements analysis, uh, you know, development, testing, and then post-production is where sort of customer success comes into play. But all those interactions that you're having with the developers as a QA engineer or with the business users to understand business requirements, the similar ideas of how you're making that internal business unit successful by delivering that product. In the startup SaaS world where you are sort of building the product in-house and then delivering it externally, uh, that interaction takes on a different sort of a, uh, level, right? But you're dealing with different uh, industries, different customers, and you have to distill that information to develop the product in the company properly. 
Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, those are uh, great insights. I think uh, communication and uh, as you all mentioned, having obviously hard skills, but also soft skills at the, uh, at the end of the day is very important because we talk about a human to human kind of interaction. So you want to be able to answer in a way that uh, would be appropriate and reflect uh, the image uh, of the company and the quality of your work. And what, um, what are the different, I would say, support the different uh, ways uh, as a customer success that you can use to grow your skills over time to help you go to the next stage? Um, I know that uh, we slightly touched upon uh, mentorship. That's always something that's uh, uh, interesting. So we could perhaps like uh, either like start with that. Uh, I guess I know that Jerry, you have a great experience uh, having mentors. So if you perhaps can elaborate on how the, uh, those mentors have helped you uh, grow into uh, this customer success role that you have today and, and even getting better in the next uh, following years, I guess. Yes. Uh, well, I mentioned um, a mentor really was the person that helped me get into tech. Just again, seeing what was possible based on the experience that I already brought to the table. Um, other informal mentors, I would say, have been honestly my peers. With the peers on my team, peers in CS and different tech companies, um, learning from them how to, you know, hey, we're hitting this problem. How do you guys deal with it in, in your company? That has been invaluable. Um, additionally, uh, from a mentor perspective, I would also say, um, sorry, I'm thinking of like two th different things at once, <laughs> but from a mentor perspective, I would also Honestly, I would challenge anybody that is in a tech company now who's in a position of influence, um, who's able to look at other people around you and say, hey, this person would be uh, really great in this role. Who are you? Um, I always say that my, the relationships that I build within my company across functions is also, um, they're also my customers in a way. Um, these folks are another way that I learn how to be better in my role. Um, I was new to tech and I was able to build relationship with some of our success engineers and support engineers and better learn about data architecture and, and help my customers, help guide my customers in difficult implementation situations. Um, mentorship just, I mean, can come from anywhere as long as you're willing to ask for help. Um, yes, yeah. I would love to take that real quick and, and run with it. Cause that is beautiful. That asking for help, I think is one of the things that really can be the most powerful way to kind of mentor yourself, but like through other people. Um, what's interesting there too, is like, a, you have to have a willingness to be wrong and you have to know what you want to be working on. Like if I, it, it, there's there's some self awareness that comes with this that you need that you need to have and you need to be able to recognize and go I just had this interaction, and they don't seem as happy as I wanted them to leave with. Yes, we solved the problem, but they don't seem as happy as 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 I would like them to have left with. Why? And if you do th like if you're interacting digitally or if you can ha um like having a uh, being able to right at at Mabel we go. Our customer support is primarily through intercom. It's a chat-based tool. Um, people can reach out, but the number, like I will, if I have an interaction or if someone on my team now has an interaction that they don't feel like went maybe the way that they expected or they're working on how they overcome objections or concerns, then they will will take it and we'll actually work together and go, hey, I am currently working on trying to overcome objections or concerns this is a conversation that did not go as well can you please help me with some perspective there's a difference between that and going hey do you have any feedback for me it's different because you're being specific someone asking for hey do you have any feedback for me that's like yeah you did great i think but when you have something specific and you're open to it, it showcases that, yes, I know that I, I was wrong and I want to be improved. And I know specifically what it is that I'm working on. And I don't want you to think about everything. I want you to help me work on this goal, this specific goal that I'm working towards that I want to improve on. And here's an example of where I didn't do it as well. 
It gives the, the person that you're trying to get assistance with that you've built that relationship with the ability to give you that specific pointed feedback that can actually drive you towards that success that you're looking for. While also, I would say building that relationship with that person and building trust, like the number of people that I have gone to and gone, hey, I'm working on this thing right now. And I think that I could have done it better. Here's an example. Can you like walk me through it? The number of people that I've done that with that have then done the same thing to me and been like, hey, I was actually just working on this thing. Can you help me maybe with some perspective? Like you're able to build mentors from the people around you and get that different perspective and work together to really build that like best practices as well as like the collaborative aspect and really that team mentality and that team mentor mentality. Yeah, absolutely. And that both of them uh, had beautiful answers. I just want to piggyback on what Damon just said in terms of, uh, being able to distinguish between mentorship as a hierarchical structure versus just a symbiotic relationship. Uh, you would often find people in the teaching profession where that when they teach, uh, they themselves are relearning or learning another layer or something that they have already known about. So, uh, you know, being a mentor in a role where you are taking a supervisory role over time, or even if it's not imminent, but, you know, eventually you will get there you are learning how to scale your operations by providing that mentorship as well. If your teammates are successful, you are successful as well. So asking for help uh, in a reasonable way, you're not becoming completely reliant on other people to lead how you do your business, uh, but to be able to provide certain solutions or ideas is very helpful. So it should go not necessarily in a hierarchical way, but in a more interactive sort of a way, if you can. Yeah. Absolutely. And I actually have a question if one of you wants to uh, answer it on that mentorship topic. Uh, how, what type of tips um, or advice can you give to someone, you know, to find the right mentor? Because as you mentioned, anyone vir virtually can be a mentor today. So as someone who wants to grow their career uh, in customer success, like what, you know, like what should they seek in a person to be a, a proper mentor for that aim? If one of you have insight, feel free to jump in. <laughs> um, I, I would try and focus on emotionally somebody who's even keel uh, so that you're getting sort of an objective uh, guidance and not too subjective in terms of how that person emotionally feels about certain situations. Uh, and to be able to do something like that, you want someone who is aware of the actual role or uh, situation that you need guidance with, but is not directly uh, necessarily associated with that same delivery, right? So somebody slightly outside uh, of your immediate impact area. Yeah, I would also say somebody that you trust to be honest with you. Um, the best kind of mentor is the one that you can take candid feedback with. If you trust them, then you then usually they can tell you anything, and you'll feel safe, um, and that'll help you grow. Trust base, yes, for sure. Yep, absolutely. And I see that on, uh, we have a question that uh, I am going to make sure we answer in the end. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for sharing your uh, insight about mentorship. I, I think this is such an important area today to help uh, us grow individually and really take anything. And it's not just about customer success. It can be uh, for all uh, other aspects in our Maria, so please, uh, you know, everyone online, like if you have any doubt, if you have any question, if you need guidance, seek some mentors because uh, they are very, very helpful for any aspects uh, in life. And I think I want to, uh, before touching on that question on the chat, I want to touch a little bit upon career options. Um, every one of you had different experiences. And for those who are listening to us today, um, what are the different career options you see uh, for customer success and support for someone who is in customer success and support and wants to grow? Like what uh, career path uh, could they be taking on after that? Maybe may, uh, if any one of you wants to jump in, feel free. Yeah, I'm, I would love to maybe start that one off. Um, yeah. It's interesting because like to the point earlier of customer support or success being a both IQ and EQ based role, like 
you kind of have the ability, the same way that you have the ability to come in and from anywhere, you almost have the ability to go out and do pretty much anything. And it depends on what you see and what you want to focus on. Um, like, if you get a bunch of technical issues come in and you really, you're finding that you're passionate about understanding technically what happened, what were the specific whys, what were the issues that got there, like building those relationships with the development team and like seeking that understanding and you can, that can build you maybe towards more of a product-based role. Someone that sees people come in with feedback requests or like they, they see people that are asking questions and maybe like those questions are really similar to other questions that other people have seen and you realize, oh, well actually that might just be a UX thing. Maybe there's a better way that we can improve how we're getting this information in front of people from the actual you like user experience aspect of it like that can drive you towards the user experience side of things if you realize like there's so many different aspects of customer support that can that can lead really well into the thing that you want it to be and i think um like it's a really powerful way to kind of get I, I think that has a really powerful way to kind of lead towards customer support can help you recognize what it is that you really like about having that role. And it can help you then go towards something that is more focused, or maybe you found the spot that you want to be. Like, I really enjoy people. Like, I, I, I enjoy connecting with humans. And I enjoy, like, guiding other people to be better with what whatever it is that they're doing. So for me, like, I could see myself moving more into, like, a leadership role within customer support, or even maybe, like, a professional services thing where like I am in charge of people that are working with with customers to implement the solution and get the absolute most out of whatever tool it is that they're working on like that's where I can see me going just based off what I'm passionate about but I think that it really has the opportunity to if you listen to yourself and the things that you are enjoying about a role that you're in to really take you to the spot in a company that you want to go yeah Absolutely. Uh, exactly what Damon said, uh, and also saw practical implementations at uh, the startup. So, uh, you know, both at Cloud Health and Immuta, uh, especially at Cloud Health, where I saw a bunch of uh, folks gain expertise in the product and interactions with the engineering and product teams, right? So they are working in customer success and support, uh, getting to know the uh, problems with the product, uh, getting to know the, uh, you know, the sort of personas of different engineers and how they work. And then what Damon was saying, like what aspects do you enjoy the most in terms of like UX uh, sort of a thought process or professional services is another one that, uh, you know, so in our support team, we had people who became so confident with the product and the services that we had that they could then go specialize either in professional services. A few folks went into product management uh, and product development. So it really comes down to it's 10 an individual's uh, desire to grow in different directions and where that path leads them. Uh, literally all doors are open once you have that product knowledge. Another quick little just like path, if you really enjoy the teaching aspect of it, um, maybe you get into doing like webinars for the company and that's more of like a marketing role. Like there's a lot of different directions you can go. Yeah, to Damon's point, even um, enablement, so going into a training role for other CS, um, for CS teams, um, product, because, C I mean, the beauty of CS is you really get to know the product well. Um, so maybe you like the product feedback that you're getting from customers. You can switch over to product from there. Um, and sales, people don't talk about how process is important in CS enough. Um, you need a process. Yes, you need to be a people person. Yes, you need to know the, the product. But if you're not responding to customers in a timely manner, if you're not, you know, that kind of process in terms of, you know, how you relate to your customers that's sales like it's such a value in sales so there's so many ways that you can go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep i i completely agree with uh, uh, all of you i myself started uh, as a customer success uh, uh, six years ago, and then I, I, I thought that uh, I would find, you know, the uh, process of getting customers in more exciting. So I did transition to sales. So I, uh, I completely agree. And um, one question, actually, I wanted to come back to uh, Damon. Um, you know, you, you, you mentioned perhaps you might be interested in becoming a team manager at some point. How would you position yourself internally to move from that individual contributor role to uh, 
a team leading, you know, like a, a leader, like a lead of a team? Yeah, so first thing, and I, this is something that I learned from experience, is you always have to nail your role first. Whatever your current role is, you have to do it and you have to do it really, really well. Ask for that feedback, build those goals, figure out what what like success really looks like in your role and rock it. Um, the briefest version of the story is uh, when I was at Apple, I had, I, I like transitioned out of my first role really quickly because I was doing really well. And I went and I was like, all right, I'm ready for the next one about six months into my second role. And I was, and I was told to come back and talk to them in about two years. And I realized how much I was able to learn during that time and how much I would have missed had I transitioned quickly. So own the role that you're in because you will never, like there's so much that you don't, you might not realize that you have to learn. Second thing is be the leader that you, not the manager, be the leader that you want to see, the one that you want to experience with and be led by. Like you don't need to be a manager to be a leader. And by people, by like, being open. I, I recommend everyone like highlight and scream out to your entire team all the mistakes you make. If you make a mistake, own it, highlight it, let other people learn from it. Be the person that built, makes that safe, makes that okay to do. Um, talk to other people, get that feedback. Go um, to uh, Jami's, sorry, I just butchered your name. Um, um, but uh, to Jami's point, the, um, the, I just got distracted by the fact that I butchered her name. Oh my God. Um, hold on. <laughs> leadership and leadership. Making, yeah. mistakes. Uh, making mistakes. Making a safe space. Uh -huh. There there were there was something else there and it and it's gone. But basically, like <laughs> do be the leader that you want to see. Oh, process. Mm -hmm. Think about how your process can be improved. Think about how it like there are opportunities for it, what works well, what doesn't and suggest ideas, be the communicator, be, be someone that kind of builds up other people's ideas. If you hear something good, hash it out, be the leader that you want to see and let the team be the people that actually kind of vote yourself in. And the last thing, which is my hardest one, write down what you succeed with. Managers, leadership, the people that make the decisions to p put other people in leadership positions don't have the ability to see every single thing that you're doing all the time. And mm -hmm. like, it's, it feels weird for someone that maybe doesn't like shouting themselves out very much, but that one thing will help you get in the role that allows you to then make the impact that you want to see later. So if you have a success, journal it, write it down, document it so that you can then lean on that information later. After that beautiful answer, I can only say Damon for precedent. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's incredible. Having the safe space, uh, having the culture, process, documentation, uh, what we also used to do with the uh, leadership at Cloud Health uh, laid out uh, retrospective. So even with engineering work, every two weeks the sprint happens and then they do a retroactive analysis of how things were successful, what got left behind. Same thing with uh, all of what Damon just said. No, yeah, de definitely. I think. Uh, this is uh, greatly um, summarizing what you should do. At the end of the day, you should be an advocate for yourself because as uh, Damon mentioned, and you know, as uh, we've talked about, like not everyone knows what you're, what you're doing. So it's very important uh, to make sure that uh, management is aware of what you're doing and that you position yourself and you own your mistake. I think there's this uh, humility that you mentioned, Damon, that is very important. And that's, um, that's something that a lot of, uh, people are seeking uh, when they want to look up to leaders. Um, I think I want to go to the question and uh, feel free uh, if you have some others, um, uh, please, if you are on the phone and listening to us today, if you have other questions now is the time. So the question we have today uh, and uh, whoever wants to answer, feel free to go in first. What is something you know now that you wished you would have learned beforehand when you first started in the customer success field? Um, I have one that comes to mind. Um, being able to have the ability to distinguish between a real problem that the customer is facing that you can solve using the product or uh, some service versus understanding what the customer is potentially just feeling frustrated about and it's out of scope for your product and your team, right? Because 
customer is right, and we are all told that and repeated uh, and ingrained in our heads, right? The customer is always right. That might be the case, at least for the interaction purposes uh, of being able to manage the customer. But at the same time, in terms of how you shield your product and engineering team to a certain extent is important as well. Uh, and that's something I had to figure out the hard way in terms of uh, trying to chase every little problem that the customers were bringing about, the prospects were bringing about, and filtering that out as to what is actually a trend, what is actually we can potentially do, and then only pushing it to that extent with the internal teams. So we, you know, so we actually are successful internally as well. I would also add, you don't have to know all the answers. Yes, you're the person that's there to support the customer, but you don't have to have all the answers. Sometimes you just have to say, you know, my, you know, I may not know everything, but I'll know where to find the answer. So feel free to just tell the customer, you know, noted, I fully understand your question now, I'll get back to you and, and use all the resources at your disposal. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, I think coming back, this is again, you know, that uh, humility aspect that is very important to have. Owning mistakes is very important, uh, as you mentioned. Thank you. We have another one. Can I add um, one quick thing to that? Oh, uh, yes, please. Go um, ahead. The statement slash concept, people are interesting. It's not just about the problem, but it's about the people too. And if you're just solving the problem, you're, I think you're doing it wrong. Like, I have a question that I enjoy asking most people and it's, what is your thing? There's no context, no anything. And it, it, it built, it brings out some really interesting answers and like, you never know what you might learn from the other person as well. So just remember that people are interesting and it will take your conversations, interactions to another level, just beyond the actual issue itself. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that's uh, also very important uh, to, to highlight. And we have uh, another question, perhaps uh, probably the last one, looking at the time. What is the difference between customer success roles and community managers? Well, I can speak to it at Clavio. Community managers are um, will generally uh, kind of help facilitate a community that, that answers its own questions for itself, a community that it's able to, uh, I'm thinking of like, I don't know why, Reddit threads, where you can ask anybody anything and they'll, you know, the community itself is answering questions to kind of relieve the support and success team a little bit. Whereas um, customer success manager role, um, you're more directly responsible for individual customers in your own book of business uh, and making sure that that book of business is successful. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you, I'm looking at the time. I think we have five minutes left. I'm just going to thank you everyone for uh, attending uh, this, this panel and uh, obviously a special thanks to our three speakers today. Thanks for being here. I really hope that you enjoyed this one hour with us and hopefully got inspired uh, to grow your career in customer success and support, which is very rich and leads to so many different paths. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to be here with you. And uh, on that, I will hand back the mic to parties to close this uh, panel.